your life. Hello, everybody again. So a very warm welcome to the symposium on the honor of uh, John Williams. My name is Andrea Dershel Wilson. I'm a group leader at the Rosen Institute, leading a group in infectious disease genetics and modeling. Uh, and I'm the one of the organizers and chairing the session one together with my colleague Ricardo Pong Wong, who has been a very long term collaborator with John. Um, as many uh, of you will know, John recently retired from his position as a, a chair in mathematical genetics at the Rosen Institute. And we thought there is no better way to honor his vast contribution to animal breeding than with a little symposium. So when we pitched this idea to John, he thought mm, this is a good idea, but he wasn't convinced of anybody that anybody would attend. So we were very surprised that uh, once we uh, released the announcement that within a few hours more than 100 uh, tickets had gone. So we had to increase the size and now we are um, experiencing some technical problems because we, we are amateurs in the system. But we hope that uh, you still have fun joining this symposium and it all works. Um, we have had uh, our last number was 750 attended registered, uh, registered attendees. So I hope you have fun. Um, we have an exciting program ahead of us because we have an eclectic mix of some of uh, John's current and former uh, PhD students, postdocs and close collaborators. And first of all, I really want to thank everybody uh, for accepting the invitation to speak. Um, and especially John for being happy to give the last word himself. Uh, and I really want to thank this fabulous, organ fabulous organizing committee to help him put this together. So before we start, a few householding questions. Uh, every speaker has about 15 minutes to give the presentation and that's followed by five minutes question and answering. Um, while the speaker gives the presentation already, I encourage you as attendees to write your questions in the Q&A box that you can see in the, in the uh, client here. Um, there's a 20 second delay between the live event and the broadcast. So type your questions early so that we can uh, uh, that we can see them in time. Um, we cannot uh, present the questions live, so the chair will pick some of the questions and the presenters will answer them. Um, we will publish. Uh, oh, yes, I forgot. Sorry. Please type the name of the presenter you want to address in the Q&A because that way the speaker can still address the questions later. Uh, and finally, we will publish the recordings of this uh, this event. So even if you miss certain sessions or certain talks, you can catch up later. So it's now time to introduce uh, Professor Bruce Weitler, who is our current director of the Roslin Institute, and he has known John for a very long time, and he will give some introductory words. Over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Andrea. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to do this, this this morning. Amongst all the trials and tribulations we are all facing, uh, the opportunity to say some words uh, about John um, and this day to celebrate his career. Uh, so, so I started off by wondering what John and I have in common and I found the answer. We both began our academic careers in the animal breeding research organization, which many of you will know was located at King's Buildings in the university campus. Admittedly, we did so in, in different decades, but um, uh, I would like to thank Abro for, for starting uh, uh, both his career, but also my career. I then realized that I'm not a quantitative geneticist, so there wasn't an awful lot else that I have specifically in common uh, with John. So I, I then made a list of his good points and his bad points. Um, so good point number one, unquestionably a brilliant quantitative geneticist. Bad point, not very good at answering emails. Very bad at answering emails, to be absolutely honest. Second good point, an amazing observer of, of people's strengths. Second bad point. Well, I've mentioned the emails and, and to be honest, I couldn't think of another one. Um, third good point. Our colleague generous in his time. 
when issues need to be discussed. And, and I just want to add a little bit of flavour to those three good points. Um, much of you, much of you will know and recognise what I say next. Um, John's academic career started when he started thinking around genetic gain and inbreeding and, and the challenges that has to the industry. And, and his thinking here led to the optimal contribution selection theory. And importantly, in parallel to thinking up this concept, um, John developed the tools to implement uh, solutions in, in practice. And this made him many friends in industry, and many of you are on this, this symposium today. John was among the first to recognize the potential of, of genomic selection. Again, pioneering the theoretical uh, concepts behind this, specifically how and why genomic selection works. But again, he worked on tools and, and strategies, how they should be optimized in practice. Driven by the use of this new and powerful tool to gain value, produce value from genotypes alone, John turned to the challenge of infectious disease and working with the notoriously noisy data sets that we have there. And this led him with colleagues to develop some critical statistical methodology required to produce unbiased genetic risk estimates. And just to give you a flavor of how well I'm versed in statistics, I realize there are three types of statisticians, those that can count and those that can't. I definitely versed myself in the latter. Anyway, working on the from from developing these powerful statistical tools, the, the output has been a new selection index for resistance in bovine TB, which, as you know, was was implemented a few years ago. Throughout all this time, while John was busy thinking up the next bit of quantitative theory to, to deploy and how industry could practically utilize this technology. John has been a tireless and trusted teacher and mentor to many, many scientists. The testament of all John's efforts and is the number of colleagues who are on this call. Andrea just told us there's 750. Each and every one doing so to say their own thank yous to John. So I'll end these kickoff comments by saying my own personal thank you. John, you have been a wonderful colleague. And I will miss immensely the conversations we have had. All in their own way, championing, championing quantitative genetics and the people involved in quantitative genetics. Thank you and please enjoy today as we all celebrate your career and your many efforts your efforts in developing quantitative theory, your efforts in changing uh, in designing how others can implement and use that theory, and finally, your efforts in growing many people. All the best, John. Enjoy the day. Andrea, please unmute yourself. You are going live. Yeah. You are. It is my pleasure to introduce our first scientific speaker, which is Professor Theo Meowissen from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Theo really doesn't need an introduction. Um, he ha everybody knows that, like John, he has been instrumental in implementing uh, genomic selection into animal breeding. Um, I also hold him personally accountable for the fact that John escaped to Norway so many uh, times the last years. He must have really enjoyed the collaboration with Theo, I know that. So today Theo will give a talk on the management of genetic diversity in the era of genomics. Looking forward to your talk, Theo. Thank you, Andrea. I share my screen first. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so as we heard, uh, John Williams has been pushing forward the boundaries of science for more than 30 years and I was lucky to be present uh, most uh, of this time. And uh, one major area where he pushed forward the boundaries was the management of genetic diversity and breeding schemes. And that's what I will talk about today. 
uh, in the pre-genomics era, the pedigree based inbreeding was the only way how we could measure inbreeding and it measures the probability of identity by descent at neutral non-linked loci. Currently, we, we are using genomic selection and you can ask yourself whether such loci exist if you are selecting for genome-wide dense markers. Um, in the genomics area, we can actually see what happens at the DNA level and therefore many genomic measures of inbreeding have been proposed uh, based on direct homozygosity of the markers or runs of homozygosity or the genomic relationship matrix, which is popular from genomic selection. Uh, people have been correlating all these measures of uh, inbreeding and uh, actually the correlations are not so high. We see here in the bottom that the um, homozygosity based measures of inbreeding have uh, good correlations and, and also the GRM, the genomic relationship matrix, together with the correlation between uniting gametes. But uh, amongst uh, a lot of correlations are very low, especially those to the pedigree based inbreeding. So my aims today uh, are um, to just to look back at what the goals of, of management really are of genetic management of diversity and what uh, measures of inbreeding uh, best align to this. And uh, finally, to see the effects of using different measures of inbreeding in, in genomic optimum contribution selection schemes. So the goals of management of, uh, uh, of uh, genetic variation are twofold. One is that we want to avoid homozygosity related problems such as inbreeding depression and loss of genetic variation because homozygosity means uh, low genetic variation. A second problem category of problems is those due to genetic drift and uh, genetic drift uh, causes random trade changes and uh, often trade changes then will be for the worst. And a specific problem is that genetic defects may drift towards high frequency and then, and then become a serious problem. All these problems are related to inbreeding and when we had only one measure of inbreeding, that one was used to address all these problems. Uh, but in the era of genomics, uh, we have more measures. Uh, one that uh, measure of inbreeding that directly relates to F is the homozygosity of the marker. So we could simply strive for low homozygosity and thus high heterozygosity. This helps uh, inbreeding depression and, and loss of uh, vari variation problems. But um, it uh, it also causes genetic drift because we uh, we we try to move frequencies towards the half, and that of obviously leads to deleterious allele popping up in quite uh, high frequencies. Oh, yeah. My screen is frozen. Uh, yeah, no, no. Um, classifying measures of uh, inbreeding and relationship. Uh, so. Uh, first, uh, we will look at uh, the GRM matrix, which is a, a genomic measure of relationship and therefore also of inbreeding. Uh, it was first proposed by Van Weyden um, and it's uh, popular from genomic selection and, uh, and implemented in GCTA. And it basically measures the allele frequency change relative to a reference, to a reference frequency PO. Uh, this is seen in this formula. So if we code the genotype as 0, 1 and 2, the expected value of this genotype is then twice the frequency and we look at the difference between the actual genotype and the expected and, and square this difference. Uh, at the diagonal, it can be shown that, uh, so a self relationship can be shown to be 1 plus the inbreeding coefficient. So we get an estimate of the inbreeding coefficient. A very similar measure is the correlation between uniting gametes, um, which is also drift based. A second category of uh, ways of measuring inbreeding is uh, homozygosity based. Um, we can just directly look at the frequency of uh, homozygous uh, alleles. Um, this is very dependent on the allele frequencies of the markers, so we could correct for that and, and correct for the expected frequency of homozygous alleles. Uh, we can also extend this measure to towards relationships or quantities between two animals, I and J, and then we basically 
putat create a putative offspring of I and J and C, what homozygosity it is expected to have. Another uh, popular measure of inbreeding is uh, once of homozygosity, which uh, measures the homozygosity of haplotypes instead of individual loci. A third uh, category of ways of uh, measuring inbreeding is by identity by descent. Uh, the most common and well known one is pedigree based, uh, so the A matrix. Here we find loops in the pedigree and, and we use Mendelian uh, laws of 50 50 inheritance. What the probability is that uh, an animal has two alleles uh, in common due to a common ancestor? Uh, Fernando and Grossman uh, proposed the linkage analysis based uh, relationship matrix. It, it combines basically this pedigree approach with markers and therefore use uh, genomics data. It's similar to the A matrix, except that uh, uh, assuming uh, this 50-50 an, uh, an, uh, inheritance by Mendelian laws, it uh, uses the markers to find out whether actually the paternal or the maternal allele was inherited and, and see whether there was uh, identity by descent or not. The founder population is uh, obviously the same as that in the A matrix because the animals are on top of the pedigree. So with unknown parents are assumed unrelated and, and non-inbred. Uh, in this way, we can uh, actually uh, measure the uh, inbreeding by identity by descent. And if we have 100% informative markers, actually it, it finds the true IBD status of the population, which is quite remarkable for such a theoretical concept. Now you might say, wait a minute, from classic theory, we know that uh, homozygosity based inbreeding and drift based inbreeding and IBD based inbreeding, they're all the same. So let's have a look at uh, homozygosity based inbreeding, which is the loss of uh, heterozygosity basically. Um, here we uh, wrote out uh, the, uh, the starting uh, heterozygosity, so that's 2P1 minus P. And then after a while, we have a frequency change, delta, and we have a, a frequency of PO plus delta. Uh, if we write out this formula, then uh, uh, we are left with a delta squared term, which uh, is basically the allele frequency squared, so that uh, reflects the drift, plus an additional term, um, which is written out here on a function of allele frequency change. If there is no selection, this allele frequency change is expected to be zero, so this term disappears. And uh, the loss of heterozygosity is actually equal to the allele frequency change squared, which is the drift. But if there is selection and we try to work out the uh, expectation of this extra term, it shows that this is the covariance between the initial allele frequency and the frequency change. So we see that uh, if there is selection, uh, homozygosity based inbreeding and, and drift based inbreeding are not necessarily the same. They are actually equal to, uh, the difference is equal to a covariance between initial frequency and frequency change. And in this case, classic theory does, does not hold. Uh, we, we looked at this, how serious this covariance was, and uh, we saw that um, uh, that in unusual breeding schemes, it was not too bad, but especially in schemes where we want to manage uh, genomic, genomic diversity, uh, there could be problems with this covariance, so it could be uh, big. For instance, uh, a way to use genomic information to manage diversity is this to, to penalize homozygosity, which we can measure uh, from the markers. So this uh, would favor heterozygous animals and would just move frequencies towards a half. And thus, if we have a low initial frequency, it move, will move upwards. And if we have a high initial frequency, it will move downwards. So we get a, um, a negative uh, covariance between initial frequency and frequency change. And the homozygosity will be uh, uh, low, but the drift in bidding may be high. So we, we may have big changes in allele frequency. Another popular way to genomically manage inbreeding is to use the GRM matrix or the Van Weyden relationship matrix. Um, 
Again, if we have an initial frequency of say 0.1, uh, then with no selection, 10, 90% of the uh, alleles will eventually get lost and 10% of the alleles will eventually get fixed. But uh, with this way of managing diversity, we will block this uh, path uh, towards fixation because that's a real big allele frequency change. And uh, basically all alleles will move eventually to loss, towards loss. Um, the same holds for alleles which are initially at high frequency, they, they will move uh, towards fixation and we get a positive covariance between the initial frequency and the frequency change. They, they move basically towards the more extreme. This uh, holds genetic drift or keeps it low, but uh, the homozygosity of course is increased if most of the loads I become homozygous. Uh, this shows the results in a genomic optimum contribution selection scheme where the GRM matrix or the Van Weyden relationship matrix is used to control the inbreeding. Um, it shows the initial frequency and the frequency change and, and its regression. So this covariance causes a, a, a positive regression line here, which is, does not look all that big. Um, the drift-based inbreeding uh, in this case was 12% uh, after 20 generations and the homozygosity based inbreeding was uh, almost 18% after 20 generations. So there was a big difference of about 5% uh, of inbreeding and it was ex exactly explained by this covariance between initial frequency and frequency change. So we see that actually the difference uh, can be big even if the covariance is perhaps not all that great and causes a 50% difference between homozygosity and drift-based inbreeding. Uh, this shows the efficiency of the genomic uh, optimum contribution selection schemes. Uh, efficiency meaning how much gain we get per unit of inbreeding or for, for a certain amount of inbreeding and uh, then for all the generations. After 20 generations, we want to have an inbreeding which was constrained to 10%, so less than 10%, and only the GLA matrix achieved that. Uh, another mat uh, matrix that resulted in quite efficient schemes, so high gain per in percent of inbreeding, was the A matrix. So the I IBD matrices uh, uh, gave the most efficient uh, breeding schemes and the GLA matrix was the only scheme that uh, kept to the restriction. Uh, the previous slide shows drift as a criteria. Now we look efficiency where we use uh, in homozygosity and breeding as a criterion. Again, the IBD based schemes are, are quite efficient, but now the runs of homozygosity scheme is more efficient and actually it achieves that uh, by initially having negative inbreeding, so increasing the heterozygosity uh, and this uh, gain it maintains over the generations. But remember from the previous slide that it has too high genetic drift. So in conclusion, there are three types of measures of genomic inbreeding. They are either drift based like the GRM, um, they are homozygosity based, based like uh, straight homozygosity or runs of homozygosity, or they are IBD based like the A matrix and uh, linkage analysis G matrix. Contrary to classic theory on inbreeding, homozygosity and drift inbreeding are not the same. Actually, the difference is equal to a covariance between uh, initial frequency and frequency change. And uh, this uh, difference is especially big in genomic uh, management schemes that penalize homozygosity where this covariance becomes negative or that penalize squared allele frequency changes where this uh, covariance becomes uh, positive. Um, so when we applied uh, this in genomic optimum contribution selection schemes and we used uh, Van Weyden G matrix to control the inbreeding, it, it controlled uh, drift inbreeding, but not the homozygosity inbreeding, which was much too high. And uh, a very bad aspect was that it drives rare alleles towards uh, loss, which is not good for uh, the uh, genomic management scheme. Uh, if uh, we used homozygosity as a measure to control the inbreeding, then uh, homozygosity and uh, inbreeding was limited, but drift inbreeding was uh, much too high, higher than its target. 
and uh, it uh, may basically cause genetic drift by moving frequencies towards the half. If we use an IBD-based uh, relationship matrix like A and GLA, they were overall most efficient. And only GLA, so the leakage analysis-based G matrix, uh, kept to the constraint, both respect to the homozygosity-based inbreeding and the drift-based inbreeding. And um, uh, there was little discrepancy between homozygosity and drift-based inbreeding. So we concluded basically that uh, linkage analysis-based uh, uh, genomic relationship matrix was best for the management of genetic variation. And finally, to acknowledgement, uh, Tusen Tusen Tuck to John for many social events, like many late night drinking evenings where John always brought uh, Scottish whiskey and uh, Praising my homebrew beer, not everybody is so polite to do that. Uh, Burns night celebrations where John brought uh, haggis and uh, funny stories on uh, moth counting and many others and pleasant walks in the countryside. And even if it, we complain it was very cold in Norway, John was always saying, uh, comforting us and saying that the Scottish weather was worse. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theo. This was an excellent presentation. I learned a lot. Um, while we are waiting for questions to pop up in the Q&A window, I would like to kick start with the first question. Um, so you, you nicely outlined how the different measures of inbreeding can differ and how they matter. Um, I was just wondering what is currently used in, in breeding schemes? Uh, to manage so natural population or um, uh, bred population, um, do we know? And this is also a question to the audience, the breeders in the audience. Uh, I just wanted to know how is that theory already implemented? Do you know? Um, I think that uh, so the the genomic optimum contribution selection theory is mainly implemented by using the GRM matrix. Um, so because that's also the matrix we used uh, for the estimation of the breeding values from genomic selection. So it seems more straightforward to use that one. Other schemes that have not come so far, they will use the A matrix. So they are still using the A matrix. So using the A matrix has the problem that it doesn't really uh, control the inbreeding because there's a lot of inbreeding going on that the um, that the A matrix doesn't see because uh, genomic selection is pushing forward certain regions in the genome and you don't see that from the pedigree, um, at least not fully. Uh, if you use the GRM, we saw that uh, the drift based inbreeding was uh, perhaps okay, but the, uh, the homozygosity uh, increased much too much. So, so that's not uh, not working very well. It's so really for yeah, um, so it's, it seems that the the theory is well advanced to the practical application, which is which seems typical. But where do you see the first application where it really matters? Do you have an example where you think well, that it would make a huge difference for these kind of populations? Maybe some rare breeds or yeah, where would you see that it matters most? Um, I would think it would matter for all populations, for rare breeds, but also for breeds that are under selection, because the, this, um, due to the intense selection, at least uh, the livestock breeds, the selection is so intense that the end, they are also on the boundary of uh, of the effective population size. Um, so they are critical effective population sizes. So they. Also, the shortening of the generation interval that often uh, resulted from uh, the introduction of genomic selection has, has increased the, uh, the rate of inbreeding because you turn over the generations quicker per unit of time. So there is a question from Andres Legara. What metric do we want to minimize in practice? The, the drift or the homozygosity inbreeding? I would think the IBD inbreeding. Okay. So, so none of them. <laughs> okay. And from Heather Kodel, it seems linkage-based inbreeding is best for the purpose outlined, but will other measures be better for other purposes? So related, 
Can you give an example of purposes where they might might be better? You may have already answered that question, but maybe you can reiterate. Uh, yeah, if, if if I really want uh, want to avoid homozygosity, for instance, uh, because I have inbreeding problems, maybe I want to um, to use a measure that uh, a homozygosity based measure of inbreeding. So I, I I'm not worried about drift but want to measure uh, increased uh, heterozygosity in the population. Um, that would also um, increase genetic diversity, uh, genetic variance, genetic variance, yeah. The, um, whether the drift based inbreeding is in any situation, would maybe only be in situation where I'm, I'm afraid of, of rare mutants. Uh, a lot of rare mutations, so I, I don't want to drift them up to high frequency. So, or I'm very scared of uh, if I'm scared of uh, uh, trade changes. I don't want to change the traits of the. So you might have perhaps a, a wild population which you have in a zoo. You don't want to change the traits of the animals. So in that case, you would uh, reduce the drift specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I'm afraid we have to leave it at there. There is more. There are more questions in the Q and A. So, uh, Theo, please check it, and if you can reply uh, by writing, we need to Thank move you. on to the next speaker. Thank you for the great talk. Thanks. We need to move on to the next speaker, um, who is also a well-known person to most of you, and her name is Beatriz Villanueva from INIA in Madrid. Um, before Beatrice moved to Madrid, she was a very close collaborator with John as well, mainly working on issues like such as conservation, genetics and inbreeding, but also other things. Um, unfortunately, Beatrice cannot give the presentation live today, but we are lucky that she provided us a recorded version of the presentation, which we're going to play now. I think Beatrice is joining as attendee, so please do post your, Q and your questions in the chat address them maybe um, the monkey to Beatrice so we know which questions are addressed to which speaker um, and hopefully she will be able to answer. So uh, enjoy the presentation of uh, Beatrice, which is on the value of genomic relationship matrix uh, matrices for estimating inbreeding. Good day, everyone. First, I would like to thank the organizers of the symposium in honor to John for inviting me to contribute. I had the privilege to work with John for many years when I was in Edinburgh, particularly on inbreeding, an area on which he has done very important contributions. I really want to thank him for all the time he gave me and for so many stimulating and inspiring discussions we have along the years. You will know that the level of inbreeding is measured by the inbreeding coefficient. This coefficient is a measure of the Proportion by which the heterozygosity of an individual is reduced by inbreeding. So it tells us the proportional loss of genetic variation. Inbreeding coefficients traditionally has been obtained from pedigree data. However, in the last two decades or so, there has been a lot of interest in obtaining inbreeding coefficient from high density SNP arrays. These genomic measures of inbreeding are more accurate than pedigree based measures, and also they allow us to differentiate inbreeding at a specific genome region. There have been several methods proposed for obtaining inbreeding coefficients from genomic data. And many of them uh, imply that these coefficients are obtained from the diagonal elements of genomic relationship matrices. Given that the diagonal of uh, the numerator relationship matrix gives us one plus the pedigree based inbreeding, it has been accepted that the diagonal elements of the genomic relationship matrices will give us one plus the genomic inbreeding. However, the proposed genomic estimators can give very different outcomes. And in fact, the correlations between them vary a lot and can be even negative. So we consider that there is still an unresolved debate on which are the best inbreeding measures when we use genomic data. So in this study, what we did was to compare different genomic inbreeding coefficients obtained from different methods 
we did that in two ways, uh, using deterministic predictions at the population level and also using real data from a peak population. These are the genomic coefficients that we have investigated. The first one is, uh, we call it a Lian Horvitz coefficient that measures the deviations from Harry Weinberg proportions. It corrects for homozygosity in the base population. The second one is the coefficient obtained from the genomic relationship matrix of Van Raden using method one that differs from the coefficient of Lian Horvitz in that rare homozygous genotypes contribute more to the inbreeding measure. The third one, is the coefficient obtained from the genomic relationship matrix of Van Raden using method two that give even more weight to rare alleles than Van Raden one. And finally, we also investigated the coefficient obtained from the genomic relationship matrix of Young that has a lower sampling variance than the previous ones. Here are the expressions for the four coefficients. I'm not going to go through them, but I just want to indicate that all of them depend on the initial frequencies, this P0, the frequencies in the base population. So here are the ranges for the genomic coefficients at the individual level. Lian Horvitz ranges from minus infinite to one and Van Raden and Jan from minus one to infinite. So it is clear that these ranges are outside the permitted ranges for probabilities or correlation. But still, we can interpret this uh, coefficient as the proportional loss or gain in variability in heterozygosity relative to the initial variability that we have in the base population. So if the coefficient is less than zero, that will mean that we have gained some variability from the base population until now. And if the coefficient is greater than zero, that will mean that we have lost some variability. I will now present the results from the deterministic predictions at the population level. And first, I just want to note that the frequencies can change from the initial generation to the generations where we measure inbreeding. And I will show that the expected inbreeding reflects these frequency changes. The expected values at the population level for the different coefficients were obtained assuming a single locus model and random mating. So the expected inbreeding at any generation t is given by this expression where the frequencies for the three genotypes are those in harvey weinberg equilibrium and the inbreeding coefficient for the three different genotypes are calculated using the initial frequencies. So in order to make predictions, we use the whole range for the initial and the current uh, frequencies. And we will see that expected values depend on the changes in frequency. Here are presented the expected values for the different coefficients across the whole range of initial and current frequencies. Given that we are dealing with a single locus model, in this case, Van Raden 1 is equal to Van Raden 2. We have divided the figures in different areas with different colors. The, in the darker green is where inbreeding is uh, greater than 1. And that means that we are losing more than 100% of the variability that we had initially, which doesn't make any sense. The areas in a lighter green is where inbreeding is between zero and one, and that means that we are losing some proportion of the initial variability. And finally, the areas in yellow is where inbreeding is less than zero, meaning that we are gaining variability. Now I will go one by one. These are the expected values for the coefficient of Lee and Horvitz at the population level. The range of values for these coefficients goes from minus infinite to one. So the lower limit means that variability in the current generation can be higher than the initial variability in the base population. And the upper limit tells us that we can never expect that we are going to lose more than 100% of the variability that we had in the base population. So the old values for this uh, coefficient make sense. For instance, when the frequency of the minor allele increases towards uh, 0.5, for instance, from 0.2 to 0.4, the expected value is less than zero, meaning that we have gained some variability, which makes sense because the maximum variability is at frequencies of 0.5. And when the frequency of the minor allele decreases, for instance, from 0.4 to 0.1, in the expected value for this coefficient is greater than zero, meaning that we have lost some variability, which also is the case. 
Here we have the expected values for the Van Raden's coefficient and the, the, the range of values for this uh, coefficient. So given that the lower limit is minus one, that means that we can gain variability, but that gain can never be more than 100% of the initial variability. And the upper limit indicates that we can lose more than 100% of the initial variability. So here I indicated in, in reddish color the results which are not logic. For instance, we have here three examples. When the frequency of the minor allele is double, but this is still less than 0.5, for instance, it goes from 0.2 to 0.4, the expected value for this coefficient is one, meaning that all the variability that we had in the initial generation has been lost, when in fact, heterozygosity has increased. Also, when the frequency of the minor allele increased more than double, for instance, from 0.2 to 0.5, uh, the inbreeding coefficient, the expected value for this inbreeding coefficient is greater than one, meaning that more than 100% of the initial variability has been lost. Though, in fact, the heterozygosity has increased. And finally, when the initial frequency of the minor allele is uh, less than 0.33, which is this point here, and the frequency of this allele decreases, then uh, the expected value for the coefficient is less than zero, meaning that variability has been gained, although, in fact, if the heterozygosity has decreased. And finally, here are the expected values for the coefficient obtained from the genomic relationship matrix of Yang. And uh, here is given the range for this coefficient. The lower limit indicate that variability can never be higher than the initial variability, which is not logic either. And as in Raden, the upper limit, which is infinite, means that we can lose more than 100% of the initial variability. Now I will present the, the results from the analysis of real data from a peak population. The data came from the Weyerbach strain, that is one of the most ancient surviving Iberian strains, is highly inbred. We have available genotypes for six cohorts, six generations, obtained with the Lumina 60K chip. So we assume that uh, the base population, the initial generation, is uh, cohort one, and we will use the frequencies in this cohort to calculate the inbreeding coefficients. We divided the genome in regions using a sliding window approach. And our results will show that the patterns for the different coefficients were very different. And interestingly, the patterns for Van Raden coefficients were like mirror images of uh, the patterns for the Leon Horvitz coefficient. Here, I'm going to present two interesting examples with surprising results. The first one is on this chromosome 14 in which uh, there is a region here that has become fixed. So in the initial generation, all the SNPs were segregating, but at generation six, all were fixed. For this region, the, the coefficient of Lee and Horvitz tell us that all variability has been lost, as uh, the value is one, which is what happened. However, the coefficient of Van Raden tell us the opposite, that uh, variability has been gained given that it had uh, negative values and close to minus one. The, the coefficient of Yang lies in between, is uh, positive, um, saying that some variability has been lost, but not all. The second example is in this uh, chromosome 13, in this region, where we have, um, we have gained heterozygosity. So the homozygosity in the initial generation was higher than the, the in the generation six. And again, this is what uh, Leon Horvitz tells us, it's a negative, meaning that we have gained some variability. And again, the coefficients of Anraden tell us the opposite, that we have lost some variability. Um, the coefficient of Yang, again, lies between is negative but close to zero. All these observations agree with the expectations that I presented before. You all know that one of the negative consequences of inbreeding is inbreeding depression. And all the results that I've been showing, which are inconsistent, 
might have consequences when estimating immune depression. So in order to investigate that, we perform a genome scan for identifying specific regions in, which are responsible for immune depression for the trait number of piglets born alive. Inbreeding depression was estimated by regressing the phenotype for this trait on the inbreeding coefficient that was included as a covariate in an animal model. We investigated three coefficients here, Leon Horvitz, Van Roden 2, and Jan. So here are three examples where the estimates for the rate of inbreeding depression, in other words, for the regression coefficient, differ for the three different coefficients, not only in magnitude, but also in sign. In the first example, the, the estimate from Leon Horvitz and um, Van Raden 2 were very similar, close to zero, but the estimate from Young was positive. In this second example, the estimates from Leon Horvitz and uh, Young were very similar and negative, but the, with opposite sign to the estimate obtained with Van Raden 2. And the, this last example, the, the estimates obtained from the three different coefficients were completely different. Uh, the estimate from Young was around zero, the estimate from Leon Horvitz was positive, and the estimate from uh, Van Raden 2 was negative. So in conclusion, the different methods for uh, obtaining genomic estimates of the uh, inbreeding coefficient can lead us to very different results. And this will have consequences, for instance, when we estimate inbreeding depression. These genomic measures cannot be interpreted as a probability or a correlation. And when we use uh, an interpretation in terms of loss or gain or viability, the coefficient of Leon Horvitz give us sensible results, but that is not the case with the coefficients of Andrade and Young. In fact, these three coefficients uh, can tell us that more variability than the one that we have initially in the best population can be lost. And also, this coefficient can tell us that variability has decreased when, in fact, heterozygosity has increased. And finally, the coefficients of Van Raden can tell us also that variability has increased when, in fact, heterozygosity has decreased. So many thanks, John. Have a very long and happy retirement. I also want to thank the co-authors of this uh, work, my colleagues Adinia, Almudena Maria, Jesus Anelli, also Armando Caballero, Miguel Angel Toro, and Ricardo Pongon. And to all of you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beatrice, for a very clear presentation. It is such a shame that we can't bring you and Tio on the stage to answer questions together because I think these were really nicely complimentary. Um, I would still like to invite all the attendees to post your questions to Beatrice and uh, also still to Theo. Um, and speakers, please don't forget to monitor the Q&A window because there are a few questions. Um, so unfortunately, we cannot make a live Q&A session for Beatrice, so we need to move on uh, to our next speaker, who is uh, Mike. Mike, right, in my program. Uh, yes. Is Mike? OK, <laughs> just because I see something else. OK. Uh, which is Mike Coffey, Professor Mike Coffey from the Scotland's Rural College. Um, I always consider Mike as the practical arm of John Williams because Mike ensured that the theory that uh, John developed together with others and Mike involved uh, finds its practical application in cattle breeding. And I'm sure he will tell us more about that today. Uh, and his title, the title of his talk is Surprise, Surprise, um, hashtag Phenotype is King. Over to you, Mike. Thank you. Can you hear me and oh, can you hear me and see me? Yes. You've got the screen. OK, right. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, as Andrea said, this will be different to the previous two presentations. And uh, I hope John's uh, listening in and uh, I say thank you now. I'll thank you at the end, John. Uh, you essentially have been uh, very instrumental in making me who I am and what I am. Um, that may be something you're proud of or maybe something else. I really don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with it anyway. So uh, I've worked with John on a number of different things and uh, somehow or another there we go uh, the history of it is that i've worked with him on, on a fertility index calving ease tb advantage guernsey society index 
and a range, whole range of other things. Um, and uh, many of those things are now in widespread use in the industry. We've had a range of grant award sizes from very small look-see type projects where we've worked on together up to two million pounds for big uh, projects. Now I'm going to focus on a couple of those, the Fertility Index and TB Advantage, because essentially they were the, almost the first and the last thing that I've worked with John on that uh, are now in, in widespread use. The Fertility Index was, um, I think it's fair to say John um, was the architect of that with his work with Nottingham University uh, and he brought together all of those people and those parties that had an interest in improving fertility in dairy cows but more importantly making it happen so we had uh, Nottingham University doing the physiology you know the uh, progesterone measurement in milk and, and blood uh, John doing the uh, theory of genetics and the uh, gene jockey stuff and uh, ourselves in SIUC doing the development and, and deployment of the index. Um, so we'll start off with the fertility index and you can see here uh, the information that gets put out by eGenes for the animal breeding industry, all of those different indexes. And you can see down at the bottom there, uh, the fertility index. Now, the reason why I mentioned this in particular, because it took me three days to make that moving slide uh, and to make that look like a moving um, magnifying glass. But at the top of that window there, you can just about see fertility index. And that shows you that the fertility index is in routine use by dairy farmers in the UK. It's one of the uh, key selection objectives um, and it's had significant impacts on profitability as we will see. So this is what fertility looked like uh, before we had a fertility index. Um, the milk production, the blue line, uh, was trotting along, you know, back from the 70s uh, until about the early 90s uh, when it took off. And that was pretty well um, at the point at which um, Holsteins began to dominate in the UK. Uh, semen was imported from all over the world, but predominantly of North American origin. And the UK index infrastructure was relatively um, poor, I guess you could say it was relatively weak. We only had PIN, which was milk, fat and protein. And inevitably having an index that emphasised pr uh, production led to an increase in production. But at the same time, uh, fertility started to decline and you can see the orange line declining as milk yield uh, rose. And of course, the Fertility Index project started, I can't remember exactly, about the year 2002 or three, something like that. Um, and the Fertility Index became um, wide, well, became published in 2005, six. So you can see that, uh, that, that there was a little bit of a lag and then uh, a, a beginning, a, a rise in Fertility Index in the UK population. Now, it doesn't look like much. It's risen from about minus a few to plus a few, uh, but it's a, a rise of 6.3 points. Um, and when you consider that uh, over 11 years and each point is actually worth £2.30 uh, to farmers, the, the value that that index has delivered to UK farmers as a result of John's pioneering work in the first place is £171 million in fertility alone. And that's discounted, so net present value, and, and represents for a figure for the whole of the UK herd. Now, <clears throat> um, how, how do farmers go about doing that? Well, actually, back to the picture with the moving uh, magnifying glass, all they do is make a choice of which bull to use. So it doesn't cost them anything. And uh, I don't imagine that uh, a semen from a high fertility bull is that much more expensive than a, a, a high production bull with low fertility. But one of the things that um, did come about as a result of this was some of the most popular bulls in the world at that point that were marketed in the UK overnight disappeared from the AI company catalogues. Um, and, and that was a direct result of us being able to make available to farmers the opportunity to make choices about the fertility of their cows and you can see from that graph what their response was um, and I, I always think that that's one of the greatest examples of how indexes can change 
animals and can change farmers' lives uh, and can change societal view of farming. Um, and I recall at the time the, the project itself uh, came under attack uh, and there was a motion put towards the funders that we should stop the project because farmers would be too confused by a, um, a fertility index and it would stop them making the correct choices in terms of production. Not surprisingly, that came from a breeding company and uh, with John at the helm standing on the front of the battleship, we saw them off. Uh, the project continued and the rest is history, as they say. Um, but uh, a very good example there of how that works. And this is just another example um, using inseminations showing that that, that is uh, continuing. So there you go. One uh, example of uh, John uh, early theoretical work finding its way all straight into production and um, changing animals. So now I'm going to move on to another one, which is uh, John's been interested in for as long as I know him. Uh, and we've worked together on this and that's predicting TB. Now I've just used this slide here um, to, to give me a sort of a placeholder. Um, but uh, the, the early work on TB was basically getting data from APHA and BCMS and matching it together and looking to see whether the data was um, fit for purpose, whether it could be used for genetic evaluations. And the early work showed that it could and subsequent work then funded by AHDB converted that um, early work into an index um, and that index was made available. Uh, it's not the, the, the highest accuracy index for reasons that I'll tell you in, in a minute, um, but it is one of the most popular indexes uh, amongst farmers because TB is a devastating disease for farmers themselves as well as their business and their animals. Uh, and any opportunity that farmers have to enable them to uh, make choices, you, as you saw from the fertility index, they, they take greatly. So um, having implemented uh, genetic evaluations for TB, uh, we've gone on and um, we've looked at uh, using deep learning models now. And um, I think this slide might be slightly out of position, but uh, just to let you know, one of the problems that we have with TB um, is knowing when an animal has become infected. And I know uh, Andrew is going to be talking about this later on and Simon Moore as well. Um, and we have milk spectral data on all cows throughout their milking lives. Um, and so what we've been doing is looking at uh, deep learning models to predict TB in, in cows. And the big problem we have is the period immediately preceding a breakdown, immediately preceding a, a failed test is when did that cow become uh, infected? And so for our training, we actually remove all data from a cow once she has failed a TB test from the data and we put it in the gray area bucket on the left hand side. We assume that all data uh, six months preceding the six months to that, um, the cow is a non-responder and after failing the test, she is a responder. So. The so just pause that for a minute and re remember that when we move forward. Um, now what can the direct impact be of using TB Advantage? Um, I, I mentioned earlier we've only been publishing it uh, for a few years, I think since 2016. So it will take some time for its impact to be visible like the fertility index. But you can see here, not uh, surprisingly, because the the daughter count is on both sides of the equation here that um, that bulls with uh, good TB advantage figures, the ones on the right hand side, plus is good, have a lower proportion of infected daughters. Uh, and again, I recall, uh, remember that the infected daughters go to create the index. So this is what you'd expect to see. But when it comes to thinking about actual use of TB advantage in terms of uh, bulls, uh, what does that mean? Well, here are the worst two and the best two bulls at the time this slide was made. They were very, very popular bulls and you can see that the worst bulls at the top had, you know, typically 10% of daughters infected. The best bulls at the bottom had typically 3% daughters infected. Now those bulls were very popular and went on to have 
a number of suns each. And you can see that the, the top, the worst two balls for TB advantage had 35 balls between suns and, and the best two had a significantly more. So then you look at their daughters and you can see again, the very best balls have an average of about 3% uh, and the very worst balls have an average of about, I don't know, six, six or so percent. Now, had the uh, people who used those worst balls and their sons had used the best balls and their sons, there would have been a 720 less infected cows on the ground. OK, that means uh, that there were 720 extra infected cows because those balls were used. Um, and those infected cows go on and infect other cows and lead to the problems that we see with TB that we can't seem to get rid of it because we cannot identify all the infected cows early enough. Now, just to step aside uh, from that, um, uh, science, as it were, just to point out one of the areas that myself and John have a common shared interest, and that's pointing walls. And I remember uh, John talking to me about the fact that he finds it therapeutic uh, at the weekend. He points walls with new cement. And just to show you there that, uh, John, that's about a tenth of the wall that I've got surrounding this property where we live now. Uh, and I shall be in the summertime pointing walls and thinking about John. So going on then to how we predict TB nowadays um, from from uh, milk mid infrared spectral data. Uh, this is the process where cows are milk recorded. The the sample is analyzed in a spectrophotometer. It produces that characteristic spectral uh, profile on the right hand side. At the moment we predict a number of management traits like fat and protein and individual fatty acids and energy balance uh, and other energy traits. But the question is, can we detect other physiological or biological signals from the uh, milk spectra? And we did that with TB and um, we used uh, synthesized data as well as real data. You can see on the left column the training with real data only we got a sensitivity of 79 percent uh, and we have to synthesize data because the um, affected and unaffected population is not balanced and deep learning models uh, perform much better when the data is balanced in the classes so we can synthesize spectral data from infected cows add it to the training data and we then get a sensitivity of 0.96. And then when we use that prediction on data uh, that the model has not seen, completely naive data, we get a sensitivity of 0.95. And that's uh, relative to the sensitivity of the current skin test of around about 80% or so. So we're really quite excited um, that we um, would be able to predict TB in a real live situation with a sensitivity higher than the current skin test. So where do we go with that now? Well, uh, we put a submission to DEFRA to field trial uh, TB and we got awarded uh, funds to do that. And we actually start next week. We have a meeting tomorrow, a kickoff meeting with, with DEFRA. Uh, and what we'll be doing there is with a, a number of farms that have signed up and they have to sign up because there's a legal requirement surrounding TB um, that they are prepared to um, uh, subject themselves to predictions from their milk samples and if any cows fail those predictions uh, a vet will go to the farm and undertake more testing uh, but those cows will then never be able to be moved from those herds other than to go to slaughter um, and we'll be doing that um, uh, this year to hopefully be able to have a test to roll out for TB. We're also going to uh, check to see whether or not we can detect TB in the bulk tank, which then means instead of uh, sampling just milk recorded cows, we'll be able to uh, bulk tank sample all herds in an area just to see whether even if we could detect a faint signal, which would then lead us on to doing more testing. Uh, so the future for that is to um, go on and do better predictions and more predictions for pregnancy and TB using deep learning. Uh, to increase the data size uh, and move on to the other diseases. And the one in particular I think John would enjoy greatly is Yoni's disease. Uh, that's on our radar to go forward. 
One of the areas of uh, interest that's been uh, it was pointed out to me by the uh, Northern Ireland group, um, Robin Skews and um, Adrian Allen, was that, that there is some work shown that there's a relationship between selection for worm resistance in cattle, a negative relationship, uh, and TB. Um, so again, I'm interested there to see whether or not uh, we, we may have to produce two indexes to ensure we get maximum improvement in TB resistance. So the value of phenotypes in the future, the, the subject matter of my talk was about hashtag phenotype is king. And one of the reasons why I said that is because John is one of the few scientists that I know who is a gene jockey and a data jockey. He has a very keen acceptance of phenotypes. He was one of those who pushed to get national recording data into genetic evaluations. And he's a very keen advocate of pharma recording. All data is good data. Remember, I said the fertility index project nearly got cut short um, and we successfully fought that. Now, a few of you won't know that uh, John actually is, is quite a comedian um, and I, I, I'd like to think I taught him everything he knows about comedy and uh, he has a very strong connection between uh, John and Norway and Finland. You've already uh, heard it from Teo there and he has very, very regular visits and I tried to teach him the joke where you know down in coffee he says oh I'm going to Norway and then I says in a, in a northern accent uh, Norway and he then says yes way okay that's the kind of joke and trust me it took ages to teach him because he said oh, I'm going to Norway I'd say Norway and then he'd say yeah no I am yeah I'm going next week I said, no, it's the joke, John. He said, oh, yes, I remember now. Uh, but he's finally got it. So hopefully on his next visit to Norway, um, you can uh, use that joke with him, uh, Teo. So the future for gathering gene phenotypes, uh, sensor data, accelerometers, infrared cameras, room and boluses, uh, machine learning, image, facial recognition, confirmation assessment, foot trimmer data, spectral data. These are all the things that are just coming into the system. Um, and I think John, John um, has, has taught a lot of people about the basics of how to take advantage of these things. And there'll be a lot of people working in all those areas uh, that will be using knowledge uh, uh, taken from John. So the conclusion to my talk is change uh, in data as an asset has begun and it will accelerate. Hashtag phenotype is king. Days of sending people out to collect data are coming to an end. And, and I tell you, if I was a, a large farmer, I would farm phenotypes. That would be the product of my farm and I would own it, pool it with others, enter into data partnerships. But basically, uh, I think in the in the immediate future, farming phenotypes is likely to be very profitable. Researchers need to become more data savvy. Um, data that was scarce and, and is protected and highly valued and, and looked after uh, be, loses its value when other data becomes more available. And again, you know, data is becoming more and more and more available. So that precious little data that you have, I would collaborate with somebody like John, get it published as soon as you can. Deep learning is very good at synthesizing new data, so we can create bigger data sets from the original. And I think um, this is one of the things that we need to, to remember. But more importantly, in the age of the genotype, hashtag phenotype is king. And I truly do say thank you, John. Thank you very much. Truly thank you, Mike, as well. Hold on, let me, I have to now unshare, don't I? No, oh no, you've unshared all. Oh, Lordy, it's been um, done for me. Control so from the centre. <laughs> it seems you have quite a bit of work to do before you can go to retirement. Um, so <laughs> there was one comment in the in the Q&A box, which is uh, just to congratulate Mike on really exciting TB results and his pointing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So while we are waiting for other questions to appear, because there's always a bit of a delay, I always have the privilege to ask the first questions, which is good. Um, I think you did a brilliant job in showing that how animal breeding can overcome potential trade-offs so with the fertility index, you know, how you can resolve it in animal breeding. And I think one, probably one of the important um, uh, new applications for that is uh, cattle's footprint, environmental footprint. Um, 
so how do you see, for example, it, how to overcome these trade-offs there? Is it the same approach? How does this tie in together? Yeah, there's a, there's a great deal of work going on in that area, as you might imagine. And I know uh, Marco Winters at AHDB has been looking at, um, at packaging up uh, existing indexes in a way that, that favours a reduced environmental impact, you know, that kind of thing. Because clearly, uh, having fewer animals to produce the same amount of milk in the country, uh, it means each litre of milk has a lower environmental impact. And I think uh, Alison Van Enemem and Frank Mitlona uh, from the US have demonstrated that the environmental impact of the US national herd is a fraction of what it was 50 years ago, half or more. Um, and simply as a result of having fewer ruminants producing the same amount of product. Um, and until we have direct measures of things like methane emissions, um, we're going to have to use proxy measures, which are pretty good, actually pretty good. Dairy cow that produces the same amount of milk, uh, but losing less, using less feed um, is an index that we're going to be publishing with the AHDB this coming year. I think possibly in April, but more likely in August of this year. So environmental impact is right at the top of our agenda in terms of selection. Excellent, good to hear. There was another comment from Richard Mott. Nice talk. By deep learning, do you mean neural networks or some other algorithm life support vector machines? OK, right. So this is the grave danger of giving a talk about something over which you're, you're um, just supervising rather than actively involved in. The supplementary questions can get you. But uh, I'm pleased to say in this particular instance, there, these what we use here is deep neural networks. And for the two particular traits in question, we use um, transfer learning, which is where you use a model that has already been trained to do something and you kind of further train it to do something else using the data you have. And in this instance, we used um, a, a ResNet model uh, that's available from Google, which is for image recognition. And it's been trained to recognize shapes in images on millions and millions and millions of images. And what we did is we converted the spectral data into an image, a grayscale image, just simply by making it a vector and putting it through, a, uh, you know, a image recognition software. And we then subjected those images to this pre-trained model and further trained it to analyze the TB images. Uh, and that's how we managed to get such good results in a relatively short period of time. And I have to say, trust me, it's actually quite easy. The theory of it, I have no idea how it operates, but the practice of it um, is actually very easy to do. So if you've got a lot of data, if you've got loads and loads of data, or it's very highly well uh, phenotyped, you know, it's categorically a yes or a no, a one or a zero, or a diseased or a not diseased, deep learning gets you some results very quickly um, and, and they are good results. OK, brilliant. Thanks to know. Um, we need to move on because time is uh, moving on. Thank you, Mike, for a really great presentation. And there will be more on the Q&A, so please monitor, keep away and chatting. Um, our final speaker for this session is our rising star at the Roslyn Institute, <laughs> is Gregor Goyans. He's a Chancellor's Fellow and he leads a research group in managing and improving populations. Um, and his group is called the Highlander Lab. Um, so today we'll talk about temporal and genomic analysis of genetic variants. And I believe we will listen to a recorded version of his talk. Yet Gregor will be available for live question and answers. So keep your questions coming. Matteo, when you're ready, please play. Yes. However, Thank you, Andrea. I'll jump straight into my talk. I will present a joint work with a number of colleagues and show two distinct but methodologically equivalent analyses. The first one was led by Leticia Lara to demonstrate the method in the context of a simulated weed breeding program. The second one was led by Maria Specher to apply the method to real cattle data. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge the funding from BBSRC and its Impact Acceleration Award. Now let me motivate why we are interested in analyzing genetic variants. 
Here at Roslin, we collaborate with a number of leading breeding programs, and we want to develop a set of tools that will enable us assessing how much variation is there in the breeding program at each time point and in different regions, regions of a genome. We want to ensure that we prevent situations where a seemingly well-functioning breeding program is outcompeted by, a, out, by another breeding program that is managing its germplasm better, as shown here for the blue versus pink breeding program. And this is a genetic team that John devoted a lot of his research time. In his words, there is just a handful of breeding programs in each species. Our future food supply depends on these programs and we should all care about how they are managed. So how would we go about analyzing genetic variants over time if we would know the true breeding values? We would simply partition the vector of breeding values by some, by some time grouping such as year of birth and calculate variance of breeding values for each time group. This would give us temporal analysis of genetic variance. Further, if we would know causal loci, we could analyze variation along the genome. The analysis would give us genic variance, that is a function of genotype variation at individual loci, and their allele effects are shown here on diagonal. Then, there is covariance between loci on the same chromosome due to linkage, shown here with rectangles around diagonal. And finally, there is covariance between loci and different chromosomes due to linkage equilibrium, shown here with rec rectangles below and above diagonal. The sum of these three components gives us genetic variance at a particular time point, and then we can calculate the same thing for every time point that we're interested in, and then we get both temporal and genomic analysis of genetic variance. However, in reality, we never know the true breeding values, let alone the causal loci, so we need to estimate all these effects. Traditionally, we use pedigree-based models where we can estimate the base population genetic variance as part of feeding the model to data. However, we want to estimate change in variance over time, not just in the base population. In 2001, Sorensen and colleagues presented a method for temporal analysis of genetic variance, which effectively boils down to the following three steps. First, we need to fit the pedigree-based model to the data. Second, we, we need to sample breeding values from this fitted model. And third, we summarize the sample values by some, by some time partitions to get genetic variance for each this time partition. Since this is a sampling-based procedure, we have to repeat the steps a number of times. And the result then is a posterior distribution for genetic variance for each time point. We're now firmly in the genomic era, and there are many proposed models and methods to estimate genomic or genetic variance. But I'm becoming more and more convinced that the approach of Sorensen and colleagues is the way forward, and some colleagues in the field have already used this in the genomic, uh, with genomic data. As before, we will follow a number of steps multiple times. There are now four steps here. First, we fit some marker-based model. Second, we sample marker effects from that fitted model. Third, from the sample marker effects and genotypes, we would calculate samples of breeding values. And then fourth, we summarize the samples of breeding values by some time partitions. And this gives us temporal analysis. If we want genomic analysis, then we would calculate breeding values for some genome partitions and summarize variances for those partitions. We tested how well this approach works with the simulation. We simulated a realistic wheat breeding program with wheat genome and selection on yield for 21 years. I will not go into details here, but the main point is that we have a number of number of groups of individuals over these 21 years. We then assumed that we have data available for years 16 to 21, which amounted to a bit more than 3,420 phenotype individuals that were also genotyped with 10,500 markers. We then fitted a ridge regression model to this data and used the sampling, the sampling and summarizing approach I described before. We have a bio archive preprint on this if you want to check the details. Here I'm showing first results. In the middle graph, I'm showing true and estimated genetic variance for different groups of individuals. I'm showing variance on the x-axis and groups on the, on the y-axis. The small vertical line denotes the true variance and distribution, these hills, denote posterior distribution. You can see that posterior distribution covers the true values nicely. You can also see that the parents at the top had the highest variance, then the variance dropped because parents in wheat are inbred and crossing them creates F1 individuals that collectively manifest less variation. However, when we sell to the F1 individuals, we get segregation in the next generation and this variance is restored. 
In the next few stages, then a, a weed breeder reduces the number of genotypes to find the best ones. And during this selection process, the genetic variance expectedly decreases. In this particular case, it went from about 6% to 4% to, to so a reduction of about one third. The middle figure is showing one breeding cycle that gives us new varieties for growers shown in black and new parents for a breeder to start the new breeding cycle shown, shown with the arrows where we do the recycling. Here on the right, I'm now showing evolution of genetic variants over time for these different groups of individuals. What you can see is that the posterior distributions shown here with the 95% intervals again match the true values in solid lines very well. So the method seems to be working very well for temporal analysis of genomic data. Here we attempt a genomic analysis where we partition genetic variants into, into genic variants within chromosome linkages equilibrium component and between chromosome linkages equilibrium component. Again, the posterior distribution shown with violin plots match the true values well, and the true values are shown with the black with the black line. We see that variance dropped between the early stage of heteros and the late stage of elite yield trials, which again makes sense because this is where the selection was happening. The genomic partitioning shows that this drop was in part due to slightly decreased genetic variance, either because we lost some alleles or more likely alley frequency simply shifted. Further, we see that, it, that in this particular simulation, within chromosome linkages equilibrium component increased but very little, while between chromosome linkages equilibrium component was the main driving force for the change in the overall genetic variance. Here I'm showing the trends of genetic variance on left and genic variance on right, and we see that most changes in genetic variance over time are largely driven by changes in linkages equilibrium and not by genic variance, although genic variance is, is decreasing but, but very, very slightly. This is somewhat expected as this program had 70 parents, which is actually quite a lot for a plant breeding program. And the resulting effective population size that we could estimate from the trends in the genic variance was 111 individuals. We then use this approach on dual purpose flag feed cattle from Germany. This cattle is used both for dairy and beef production, which makes it environmentally more efficient than specialized dairy or beef breeds. We had access to about 9,000 progeny tested bulls from a period of over 25 years. The bulls have collectively sired more than a million progeny, and all progeny phenotypes have been summarized per bull in the form of progeny phenotype deviations. We had phenotype data for milk yield and milk fat yield as dairy traits, and net gain and carcass grading as beef traits. The bulls were genotyped with 50K Illumina Sniperay. On this, on this data, we run a multi-trait marker-based model. Specifically, we use a four-trait ridge regression model with correlated marker effects. Then we use a sampling and summarizing approach as described before. Here are variants for individual traits over time in this cattle data set. We can see that genetic variants for milk yield, fat yield, carcass quality are decreasing, while for net, for net gain is actually increasing. The changes are not very dramatic, so the breeding process is to be in a good shape. Yet the collaborators still seem that the changes are somewhat large and were a bit skeptical of the results. To look a bit more into these estimates, we specifically looked in the trend of genetic variance for milk yield and performed genomic analysis. We partitioned the genetic variance on top into, gene into genetic variance on the left and linkages equilibrium on the right. I'm not showing here further partition of linkages equilibrium into the within chromosome and between chromosome components. We can see on the left, the genic variance even slightly increased over the time or stayed constant towards the end of this period. It's hard to tell if this uh, increase is actually significant as we have quite a lot of uncertainty in our, est our estimates, but it seems that genetic va the genic variance actually is not decreasing over this period. And Comparing the genetic, gen, the trend in genetic variants at, 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 at the top and linkage equilibrium on the right, you can clearly see that the trend is pretty much the same and that the changes in genetic variants over time are pretty much driven by the trend in the linkage equilibrium over time. We have been looking at variances for individual traits, but a lot of traits in breeding programs are correlated. I would like to point out that the same framework can also be used for temporal and genomic analysis of variances 
as well as covariance between the traits in exactly the same way as shown before. To give you a flavor of what we can do with this approach, I'm showing here genomic analysis of correlations for the pairs of traits in the cattle dataset. We have presented results such that the sum of values in each plot gives the overall genetic correlation between the, between the traits across the whole period that we collected the data. We see that the very high genetic correlation between milk yield and fat yield shown in the top left uh, plot is driven by largely positive gene correlation on each chromosome as well as positive linkages equilibrium component. There was exception on chromosome 14 where there is a known pleiotropic gene DGAT that has op opposite effect on milk yield and fat yield and this has been captured here by the within chromosome linkages equilibrium component. The effect of DGAT gene should really be captured by the gene covariance between the traits but the estimation is not perfect. For other pairs of traits, we don't see large values apart from correlation between net gain and carcass quality, which is primarily driven by gene contribution. And there are regions of chromosome 10 and 14 that harbor large effects. And this is again picked up by the LD component. A sharp pipe from someone like John would notice very high genetic correlation of 0.82 between milk yield and fat yield. This value is inflated because we have done genomic analysis across the whole period and we have therefore captured also genetic trend and with that biased estimate of the genetic correlation. To fix that, I'm here showing evolution of genetic covariances and correlations over time. Looking at the top row, we see that covariance between milk yield and fat yield decreased over this period, while it was stable for milk yield and net, and net gain, and it seems to have increased mildly from negative to zero between milk yield and carcass quality. Looking at the bottom row, covariances the covariance between fat yield and net gain was stable. Again, it slightly increased between fat yield and carcass quality and increased a bit more between net gain and carcass quality. In conclusion, I can say that we have a method that enables us to do temporal and genomic analysis of genetic variances as well as covariances. The method is a simple extension of the Sorensen's method to the genomic setting. In fact, any model or method that can generate marker effects can be used with this approach. For example, LASSO, BASE-R, or similar models and methods. Our results show that selection induces negative linkages equilibrium, which reduces genetic variance, while we see only minor changes in genic variance, and that also means in allele frequencies, which is very much in line with the, with the, with the early work of Bulmer. In our work, we saw stable within chromosome linkages equilibrium and quite large changes in, in, in the between chromosome linkages equilibrium, which I think makes sense given that the recombination is a quite rare event. However, continually decreasing between chromosome linkage disequilibrium suggests that possibly between family selection is becoming more and more intense in the cattle population, and we're now using the same framework to, to evaluate this. Finally, I would like to close by saying that John surely agrees that we now have neat tools that allow breeders to track trends in genetic means, as well as genetic variances and covariances. Such tools will allow breeders to evaluate their breeding programs and ensure the breeding programs are sustainable and can continue delivering genetic gains in the long term. Thank you. Many thanks, Gregor. Mattia, can we get Gregor on screen? Is Gregor yes, screen right. on? Brilliant. I am. Um, Gregor, there was, thank you for the good presentation. Um, I think all presentations together show uh, that breeders really need to be on their toes because there's a lot of exciting theory coming out. <laughs> there was one question, Gregor, from Peter. And this is the, Sor did you see it? The Sorensen method takes a snapshot of the genetic variance and is affected by temporal and chance effects such as deviations from Hardy-Weinberg, accidental, weak LD, and so on. Why are we interested in including such non-permanent effects given that managing genetic diversity seems to be a strategic long-term issue? Thank you, Peter, for this question. Um, I partly agree and partly disagree sort of with, you know, where you're trying to, where you're getting with your question. Just let me, let me, let me you know, answer this in, in a couple of steps. First, I think that, you know, we as, you know, breeding community have a bit of an issue because quite often we talk about genetic trends, 
And by this, we all we always really mean about trend in the estimated breeding values, but actually that's just a trend in genetic mean, the estimated genetic mean. But there is also always, you know, a trend in genetic variance that I think that all breeding programs should be looking at, and they are looking sort of versions of that, you know, looking the evolution of breed inbreeding over time. So, you know, by using these methods, I think, you know, we can shed a light on what was happening before in the breeding program and really assess if the breeding program is sort of in a healthy or un unhealthy stage. So I do think, you know, looking back is useful because it tells us, you know, what we should be really focusing going into the future. And, you know, because we can do this genomic analysis now with, with, with genomic data, we can really see what processes in, the, in our population are actually driving changes. For example, we saw in, you know, for the three of the four traits, we saw that the variance is decreasing, well, obviously because of our selection. But we also see that, for example, for one trait, the variance was increasing, which is, you know, somewhat surprising result. And we are looking why that actually is increasing in which regions of the genome. But also, you know, the results really show that most of the changes are driven, as you say, by sort of non-permanent effects. And it seems that at least the breeding programs that we looked at seem to be in quite healthy state and they really shouldn't be worried about, uh, you know, their genetic diversity. However, I am aware of breeding programs where they do have issues and, you know, they are, in they are interested in, you know, what exactly is the problem in their breeding program or which regions of the genome they, they are having issues with. Now, just sort of a technical detail about the deviations from the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and linkage equilibrium. So I mentioned three components, genetic variance, LD within the chromosome and LD between the chromosomes. But I would also like to mention that just the, the genetic variance, there are two versions of it. One is where we, do, where we, where we assume the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, so the, you know, the equation 2PQ alpha squared. But if you know, in breeding, we always have the departures from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium just due to selection. So, you know, the, the genetic variance then really becomes 2PQ bracket, you know, within the brackets, one, one plus the inbreeding coefficient times the, the, the allele substitution squared. And with the methods that I presented, we can actually, you know, disentangle these effects quite nicely. And we have quite a bit of work here internally in the lab where we can show all of these things. So I agree with you, these are methods looking into the past, trying to see what was happening in the breeding program. But, you know, we are doing that so that we can suggest the breeders what they should be really focusing going into the future. Thank you for the question, Peter. Okay. Two more short questions, if you don't mind. One is from Dan Chanula. Have you applied this idea to study trends in Chiba E variants? In brackets, Sorensen's birthday is coming up soon. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel, for the question. Um, this is something that I have on my mind. As you know, you know, modeling G by, G by E interaction is, is notoriously hard, but uh, we have some work uh, happening in the lab, and I am nudging, nudging the student that is working, working on that topic, you know, to, to use also our methods, not just estimate the, the you know, the variances with the, with, with, the, with the Raymond method, but actually do the sampling procedure where we can actually see you know, where the G by E variance is in which in which different parts of the country, etc. Excellent. And final question from Noelia. Nice presentation. Do you think that this method can have some sample size bias? <clears throat> well, the method is going to be as good as the model, you know, really nicely fits to the data. And this can be either because the sample size is not, you know, big enough. That's definitely an issue. But it also can be an issue if the model is sort of misspecified. So we really need to be careful in sort of extrapolating or not, uh, you know, from this analysis. So both sample size and, you know, model fit or model advocacy is, is important, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Matteo, can you put me on live? So with this, I want to thank all the speakers for giving really excellent presentations. Um, this concludes the first session. The next session starts at one o'clock sharp. So I apologize, we went over and I apologize again um, for, the, uh, for the technical hiccup. This was really outside our control and we only noticed when people started to log on. 
um, try to log on. So apologies for these technical glitches. We really did our homework <laughs> to try to avoid it, but we couldn't. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session. Please log out of this session and use the next link for the next session and hopefully you don't experience the same uh, the problems again. So we see you for the next session at 1 p.m. UK time shop. Thanks again to the speakers.